Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the International Cultural Center. <clears throat> First order of business, Dr. Falwell students, please sign in with Dr. Falwell. Where is Dr. Falwell? Right there. Right, right there. After the talk. Yes. After the talk, don't forget. Um, it is my distinct pleasure. Put my glasses on. <laughs> And to, uh, to introduce Dr. John Agresto, author of Mugged by Reality, The Liberation of Iraq and the Failure of Good Intentions, former president of St. John's College in Santa Fe, former senior advisor to the Iraqi Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research, and founding member of the Board of Trustees, Provost, Chancellor, and Dean of the Faculty, at the American University of Iraq in Kurdish Iraq. Dr. Agresto brings an insider's perspective to the successes and failures of promoting democracy in the Middle East, a topic that has been on the minds of many, many of us as we, as we have watched the optimistically named Arab Spring turn increasingly wintry. Before I turn the podium over to Dr. Agresto, I must add that the Office of International Affairs is but one of three sponsors. We give special thanks to our other two sponsors, the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization and the CH, the CH Foundation. Uh, we thank you, all of you, for making this evening possible. And so now, without any further chatter from me, here is Dr. John McPherson. Students come here tonight and entertain their family, right? Hey, it helps. Come on, it helps. It helps. Good. Okay. Uh, title of the talk is, as Jane Bell said, was promoting democracy a mistake? I actually, if I had to revise it, I would even make it in the present tense. Is promoting democracy a mistake? Because it seems that we are have not finished doing it. Okay. Uh, I first went to Iraq some of you know, in 2003. I went because I was asked by the Pentagon uh, to go and try to help rebuild the graphs. Uh, once fine, but then crumbling and <coughs> archaic system of colleges and universities. <coughs> I stayed for almost a year working with the Iraqi Ministry of Higher Education, uh, in a pretty much failed attempt to get their universities back on their feet. All my, my friends and most of my family thought I was crazy. As everyone said, if, if I wanted to be shot at, I could just move back to New York. Um, and if I wanted to be frustrated and live a life of one failed project after another, I could stay on as a college administrator here in America. But no, no, I went to Iraq, uh, and I even went back, as Jim seemed to uh, uh, indicate, I went back again repeatedly, uh, found a university there, a public county university there, and I finally left for good at the very end of 2010. So I haven't been back all that long. But why? Why? Why would a perfectly normal person, or if not perfectly normal, why would I, uh, why would I uh, uh, go to a war zone and try to help perfect strangers? Why? Well, I, I know this is odd, but the first reason I went was because I wanted to do something, as I just said, to help. To help rebuild their educational infrastructure, to help modernize their curriculum, to help professors and students once again connect to the outside world of higher education. To help a strange and quite American attitude in world affairs, and one that simply perplexes both our friends and our enemies everywhere else in the world. Beyond this strange American view that helping others is good in itself, I went for political reasons. Iraq, as we all read at the time, was ready for democracy and was poised for freedom. 
like the people of Germany and Poland and Hungary who had just a few years before thrown off their Soviet rulers and established liberal and democratic regimes allied with the West, Iraq was ready to do the same. Or so we thought. Well, so far it might seem I went to Iraq for them, mostly for the Iraqis, who helped them fix their schools, their universities, and to help them live in freedom. But that's not really the whole of the story. Uh, I went in even larger measure for us Americans, for us, the country. I knew from my studies in politics, and I'm a political scientist by training, uh, I knew from my studies in politics that why, while America has a lot <clears throat> to worry about internationally from non-democratic nations, let's say, for example, places like North Korea nowadays, it has much less to worry about from democratic countries, especially liberal democratic countries. For instance, in the last century, our deadly antagonists, countries that actually fought us in war or threatened us greatly, were Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the Communist Soviet Union. All of them were totalitarian nations of one stripe or another, or what we would easily call unfree regimes with directed or subjugated people. Nonetheless, even though America has fought any number of wars over the last 20 years, I actually tried to it up. It's amazing the number of wars we have fought. Uh, starting with, if you want to start with the Revolutionary War, and then go to the war with the Barbary Coast Pirates, the, you know, the, the War of 1812, the War with Mexico, the Civil War. It's incredible that we've spent at least a third, probably more like a half our time at war. Not one of them. Not one of them was ever with the liberal democracy. But we might sometimes worry about engaging in conflicts with Iran or China or Pakistan or even Venezuela or Cuba. We might worry about those things. None of us, I guess, can even imagine a war with Poland or Great Britain or Canada or Costa Rica. For various reasons, liberal democracies, while they might fight everyone else, never seem to war against each other. Sometimes it's said, and it's a handy way of reference, no two countries that have a McDonald's have ever fought against a war against them. <laughs> a good research task for some of you uh, political science majors might try to be to figure out why it is so that liberal democracies, while they fight wars a lot, do not fight each other. I don't believe the definitive word of that's been written. So, one of the main reasons an American might want to see democracies grow up in the world abroad, especially liberal democracies, democracies with free and tolerant citizens who possess their natural and civil rights, is that such nations wind up not being America's enemies, but our friends. So, to have a friendly regime in the Middle East, to have a nation that would look forward to being an ally rather than an enemy, to have a nation that wouldn't be desirous of warring against its neighbors or destroying Israel, well, that would be a major and significant advance for all of us. And so I thought the effort to try and help was worth it. <clears throat> well, so far, everything I've said about my going to Iraq is true, uh, and I stand by it. Americans do like to go over and to help. President Kennedy knew that when he set up the Peace Corps, for example. And liberal democratic countries rarely, if ever, make war on one another. But there was a third reason that I learned, not from sociology or political science, but from philosophy, that I thought was true at the time. And now I question. The third reason is this. I too believe, along with President Bush and others, that the desire for freedom was a universal desire. I believed, in addition to that, that given a choice, all men and women would choose to live in a democracy where they could govern themselves as a nation, rather than live under a dictator or an oligarchy or a self-appointed elite. After all, wasn't this the lesson of Eastern Europe? Wasn't this the lesson of Poland, of Hungary, of Czechoslovakia? That people are willing to battle in the streets to overthrow tyranny and to achieve freedom? 
Wasn't this the lesson taught by that one young man standing up to the tanks in Tiananmen Square? Wasn't this the lesson of our own civil rights movement? That people would brave dogs and guns and water cabins in the hope of being free? Well, it may be a lesson that some places teach, but I'm not sure any longer that the love of freedom really is a universal desire. What so many of us who study political philosophy thought were feelings common to all, desires that were deeply rooted in our common and universal human natures, might actually not be. What I saw in Iraq was a people perplexed over why we held freedom in such high regard, and perplexed over the value and benefits of democracy. Now, of course, all this takes us Americans by surprise. We have slogans, and we believe in them. Give me liberty or give me death. Live free or die. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. We believe that all men are created with certain inalienable rights, among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yes, we had slavery and secession, but we also had people marching off the war singing, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. And they did. Hundreds of thousands died to help make men free, men they never knew, never met, might not even like. We believed, and I think we still believe, that all men desire freedom and that they deserve it. We believed it in 1776, we believed it in 1861, and we believed it in 2003. But I have to say that while every now and then I see uh, live free or die on a license plate uh, or a bumper sticker here in America, you better believe that I never once saw it on a car where I saw a car with that slogan on it in Iraq. So what's going on here? How can the love of liberty and the value of democracy not be universal? How is it that what we cherish not be cherished equally by others? Let's take a moment to look at the matter a little more closely. Uh, let's start with liberty. Right after Operation Iraqi Freedom started in 2003, I was listening to a radio talk show commentator who said he heard one excited Iraqi man run up to a few soldiers saying, Freedom! Freedom! Which he then followed with the words, Whiskey! Sexy! <laughs> I guess that was his highest understanding of what liberation might happen in store for him. Broads and booze. <laughs> My guess is that the man was soon disappointed. It's not that Iraqi men have no interest in alcohol or women, uh, but that there were, let's say, other things on their mind as well. <clears throat> to some, indeed to many, freedom seemed to mean looting and theft. It meant freedom to get back at old enemies without anyone stopping you. It meant doing whatever seemed profitable at the moment without much restraint. But when we looked at the chaos that seemed to engulf Iraq soon after liberation, all some of us could say was that freedom is messy. But it was more than messy. It was in many places, including Baghdad, total and deadly chaos. It might be useful to understand that this was not the first time in Iraq that freedom and democracy were proclaimed and a popular government set up. In 1958, a military coup overthrew the monarchy of King Faisal II. Uh, the young king and members of the royal family were killed, and their bodies were hanged by their feet outside the royal palace. No, no trial, no anything. They were just killed, then hanged upside down outside the palace. The king had a prime minister who managed to escape uh, and I, I, I think he was dressed as a woman and managed to escape. Soon, however, he too was captured and killed, and his body was dragged behind the back of a car until all that remained of him was half a leg tied to a rope. With that, Iraq was proclaimed a republic. Now, all older Iraqis I met remembered those things. 
even though they didn't talk much about them. It was events such as these that led a number of Iraqis I met to question whether they and their fellow citizens were ready for democratic rule. In their memory, in their history, democracy didn't mean peace and prosperity, but as I say, chaos, deadly chaos. Now, I know that 1958 sounds like ancient history uh, to most of you in this audience, uh, but to those of us old enough to remember the 50s, should remember that 1958 was not too long after the second election in America of Eisenhower over Adlai Stevenson. Yet, who among us in that age group could even think it remotely possible that General Eisenhower would solidify his rule by killing Mr. Stevenson and dragging him behind the car? Let me sell you. So let's get down to the issue at hand. Was, is, promoting democracy a mistake. Despite what I thought in 2003 when I felt that a democratic Iraq was in America's interest as well as everyone's <coughs> interest, I now no longer can think that. What led me to rethink the view that the coming of democracy to Iraq and subsequently to the whole Middle East and beyond would be a very good thing? First, the candor and clear-sightedness of Many of the Iraqis I worked with in Baghdad, especially Iraqis who were secular Muslims or who belonged to ethnic or religious minorities. <clears throat> Unlike we Americans who thought that the thought of democracy as an end, as a, as a good in itself, these Iraqis knew that democracy is simply another form of arranging power. They understood the obvious that democracy is a means, sometimes a good means, and sometimes a bad means, to reach the real goals of political life, peace, prosperity, justice, liberty, and security. But we Americans insisted those things all followed in democracy's work. It was through democracy that the good results of political life would become real. In this view, Democracy is a sort of medicine, something administered to countries to make them better. Indeed, we Americans seem convinced of two things. First, that democracy was how all men were meant to live, that unlike autocracies of whatever kind, democracy was just in itself, correct in itself. Being just and correct, it included in its very essence the ideas of freedom, equality, protection of rights, and toleration. Democracies were natural, democracies were how men achieved a just political life, and most assuredly we believe democracy is how men achieve freedom. Second, and equally problematic, we constantly gave the impression that being natural, democracy was easy. Throw off the tyrant, overturn the ruling class, write a constitution, hold elections, and voila, democracy. In all this, we betrayed an understanding both alien to our own democratic beginnings as well as removed from any reading of history, ancient or modern. To be seduced by the rising tide of democracy worldwide, we now have to block from view the democratic elections in Gaza, or, and their democratic elections, where a terrorist organization bent on the destruction of its sovereign neighbor one today. One has to forget that a quasi-military rule in Pakistan was overthrown, and the new, more democratic government now plays the role of double agent in the war on terrorism, where it looks to destabilize an already unstable Afghanistan. One has to forget that now in a more democratic Afghanistan, not one Christian institution, no church, no charitable organization, no school is left. In, in Afghanistan, apost apostasy is not only punishable by, by death in theory, but also in fact. Perhaps might one, one might want to look at the democratic mobs in Libya executing all the blacks they capture, both men and women, or the mobs in Egypt burning Coptic churches or rallying almost daily for the destruction of Israel. And all this before the latest attacks on American consulates and embassies and the taking of American lives. So what went wrong? What went wrong? 
How could so many thoughtful and politically savvy Americans, including so many at the State Department, at the Pentagon, as well as those in high elected political office, hold to a view, and I don't just mean uh, the Bush administration, but these, the policy of democratization has, has been carried on forward by the Obama administration fully. How could so many hold to a view whose consequences seem so unconducive to freedom? to security or to peace? How could so many otherwise careful readers of history, both liberals who thought they could speak for the aspirations of the people of the Middle East, and conservative, conservatives who fancied themselves be partisans of the American founders, be so blasé about the spreading of democracy wherever? Let me try to answer that by beginning somewhat superficially. I think that our first understanding of government was defective. Perhaps because of the success we have had in America with democracy, we now think that democratic government doesn't have to be crafted, but merely willed into being. But what we are learning the hard way in the Middle East is that there's little in politics harder to create than a just and stable democracy. Nothing takes more art, more human effort, and more intelligence to design than a good democracy. Autocracy is easy, ruled by tyrants or by elders, or mob rule is easy. But a liberal and just democracy is hard to make, and even harder to maintain. What else about government did we fail to understand? Well, the most obvious mistake was to make so easy an illusion, so easy an identification between democracy and freedom. I said a few minutes ago that the flourishing of liberal democracies worldwide was both good for our own security and the safety of free countries everywhere. But the operative phrase is liberal democracies, not simply democracies. There is little that is clearer in today's politics than the fact that what we have encouraged, supported, and even fought and died for in the Middle East are not liberal democracies. Nor is, simply, is it simply that protecting the rights of women or secularists or, or Christians and other minority religious sects is not apparent. Even within the predominant culture itself, we see smaller Islamic, or tribal, or ethnic minorities harassed and persecuted every day. Our notion that the overthrow of autocracy and the coming of democracy would also mean the coming of freedom is simply wrong. Our notion that the overthrow of autocracy and the coming of democracy would also mean the coming of freedom is simply wrong. Yes, as I hinted at before, those who thought that the promotion of democracy would also bring about the birth of freedom in the region could point to the liberation of Eastern Europe from Soviet Germany, or liberal democracy building in Germany and Japan after the war, or even the wonderful success of the civil rights movement here in America to prove that all people really do wish to live in freedom. But those examples, fine as they are, seem not to carry us to the facts of what we see around us today. But why? Why? Don't all men wish to be free? We ask this a lot. I don't think we know the answer. Don't all men wish to be free? And in asking that question, we assume the answer is yes, of course, of course. But the correct answer to the question, don't all people yearn for freedom? is no. Some people, perhaps most people, prefer other goods. Indeed, some people would rather be holy than free, or safe than free, or be instructed as, into how they should lead their lives rather than be free. Many people prefer the comfort of strong answers already given, rather than the openness of hazard and hazards of freedom. There are people who would never dream of substituting their will for the imams or pushing their desires over the customs and traditions of their families. Some men, to use an older metaphor, kiss their chains. As good Americans may wish to say that all people deserve freedom, but to say that all people desire it is flat out wrong. What we have assumed to be fundamental as a fundamental aspect of human nature the desire for freedom may not be natural at all. 
but more. To ask, don't all men want to be free, may well be to ask exactly the wrong question. The right question is, do you want your neighbor to be free? If the answer come back, comes back, my neighbor's tribe is full of thieves and assassins and needs to be exterminated, or my neighbor's views are an affront to God and will lead this nation to eternal damnation, you can be certain that the raw material upon which a truly free and liberal democracy can be built is not there. Democracy, we need to understand, is ruled by the people. Democracy, more than any other government, takes on the character of its people. But if the people are intolerant or rapidly sectarian, if they are accustomed to being told how to live rather than to make their own futures, if they see every human exchange as a zero-sum game, with every neighbor's success a subtraction from their own, or if there is no patriotism, no real love of neighbor, no willingness to compromise, then liberal democracy is close to impossible. So far I've tried to reflect on two problems we faced in trying to spread liberal democracy abroad. The first is political. We have always understood, going back to the time of our family here in America, that the protection and growth of liberty requires certain institutions, certain political arrangements. We here in the United States are attached to checked and balanced government, an independent judiciary, a written constitution with an enforceable bill of rights, calendared elections, federalism, local government, vibrant civic institutions, and above all, the separation of church and state. We are attached to them not simply because they are ours, but because through them we have enabled decent and free government to flourish here in this country. Are all these same institutions necessary everywhere? No, not all of them. But some way of politically moderating and checking excessive majority power is vital if democracy has any hope of being temperate, tolerant, and just. Besides institutions, the founders of America understood one thing that was essential in making democracies free and just. As James Madison so clearly argued, the most important political ingredient in democratic freedom has always been what we political scientists call pluralism. No matter what political institutions you have, if the nation is a divided nation rather than a pluralistic nation, liberal democracy will fail. If the term pluralism sounds too old-fashioned or political science substitute diversity, it's pretty much the same thing. Now it doesn't matter if the division is between a few rich and the many poor, or between Catholics on one side and Protestants on the other, or between farmers and ranchers, or between Sunni and Shia, or between believers and infidels, wherever there's a majority side with passionate interest and a small minority side, the minority will constantly lose. Sadly, in the various Arab Spring nations, divisions are everywhere and pluralism is all too rare. But if the first problem is political, the second, and I think far more serious problem in spreading democracy, is cultural, not political. In fact, the most important issues in constructing just and free and democracy might not be political anywhere near as much as cultural. We political scientists have something of a professional fiction. We think that the type of government people live under shapes their culture. Indeed, we believe political life shapes human character. We believe, to use the jargon of my trade, uh, that politics is architectonic. So we think that aristocracies produce a society with aristocratic desires and aristocratic honor, that tyrannies produce a culture of fear and dependency with slavish or vicious subjects, and that democracy would produce a culture that is tolerant, peaceful, and understanding of difference. But this might simply be backwards. I was always struck by Alexis de Tocqueville, who, in writing about America, made it clear that we were on our way to being a democratic people long before we established a democratic government. We had a democratic culture before we had democratic institutions. 
We serve not only on juries, but we listen to both sides before we render judgment on our fellow citizens. We had professional, civic, and social institutions that taught us how to work together. We fought a revolutionary war against the British crown, in which perhaps a third of our citizens were on the British side. And after the war, there were no show trials, no recriminations, no mass graves. Do you know how strange that is? We did not have a culture. We had a culture of democratic tolerance before we had the United States. More importantly, most importantly, over the years before our revolution, we in America and in the West inhabited, inhabited a culture that had tamed the fury of religious sectarianism. There's a long list of both very good as well as very horrendous events that led to the taming of religion. The taming of Christianity, to be exact, in our city, here in the West. Liberal and Enlightenment philosophy uh, and the rise of commerce, commerce that diverted men's interests away from sectarian ferocity. Uh, those were among the most fortuitous events. The torture and killing of almost a third of Europe's population in the religious wars of the 16th and early 17th centuries can be counted as among the most horrible events. But whatever the reasons why that we had not erased religious differences, uh, we had by and large erased sectarian warfare as part of our culture. We had, by the end of the 18th century, pretty much established in the West sufficient cultural and religious habits to give the rule by the ballot, rather than rule by the bullet, a more or less secure foundation. To do it the other way around, to begin with a democratic government, to establish as we try democratic governments in the world, and then hope for a people to, to develop who have a democratic outlook and habits, to have these democratic outlooks and habits grow as a result of the institution of democracy is a belief of full integrity. Now, since we are this evening in the International Cultural Center of the University, it might seem obvious to you who are part of uh, the center that culture, especially religious culture, is exactly the thing that can make or break the prospects of democracy. That culture is often perhaps always, a trump card in what people believe and in how they live. But the fullness of this view, I must tell you, is not without its antagonists, especially in our modern politically correct world. For example, you would think that the left, which speaks often about diversity and multiculturalism and the importance of culture, would understand the centrality of culture better than the right would. Yet while liberals may claim to see the formative nature of culture, they really seem to, to me at least, to go beyond some superficialities. The left, it seems, would rather have us celebrate other cultures than understand them. For understanding the other might, might lead us to judge it and even to oppose it. Above all, despite their attachments to the virtues of multiculturalism, rather will the left admit that culture especially religious culture, shapes a nation and a people's character, their character, their souls. To the left, culture matters, except where it really matters. It is the character of the culture, whether it countenances independence, initiative, and religious and intellectual freedom on one hand, or fanaticism, obedience, hierarchy, and division on the other, that will shape the aspirations of its citizens and thus the nature of its democracy. A culture in which there is little religious or intellectual freedom, where adherence to the plan of imams or religious scholars is sacrosanct, a culture that sees it as its duty before God to punish the sin, kill apostates, exterminate God's supposed enemies, a culture where there is no deep acceptance of difference. Such cultures will produce their liberal souls or hardly strong candidates before a truly free and liberal democracy. Nor is the right without fault in this matter. Neo conservatives, especially, with their insistence on the universality of human nature and human desires and the secondary, the secondary character of culture, fail to see the true centrality of culture in shaping human life. 
all too often conservatives rail against multiculturalism and proclaim that the important thing to know is that all men share a common human nature. That may be true to this deep down, that, for example, right and justice are universal concepts, that genocide or slavery or the killing of the innocent or the subjugation of women are evils everywhere in every place in every culture, whether or not the culture recognizes it. But the fact remains, while right and wrong, good and evil might be universal, how people act is always more determined by what their culture honors and demands, and not by what philosophy might tell them is right. I remember a discussion I had with the university administrator in Iraq. He told me that the notion that Americans would volunteer to go to a foreign country in the midst of a war, as I said before, compelled, was laughable, ridiculous. Couldn't believe it. It was, as he said, unnatural. Nobody goes to the war to heaven. And I knew it was true because I saw it every day with my own eyes, with all my, with both soldiers and civilians who were in Iraq. But I also know that it's an impulse that arises more from Jefferson's words that all men are created equal, coupled with the teaching of our religious heritage, more from those things than from the demands of our common human nature. Nature may well indeed simply say, stay home and be safe. Let me say it. Stay home. But the West, in the West, every child is taught from the cradle forward the importance of the golden rule that we should do unto others as we would like done unto us, perhaps the tale of the Good Samaritan, and talk the notion of the equality of all people. All these cultural teachings, all these stories, ideals, ideas, lessons, tales, only seem to say against our raw natures, what possible, go ahead. Why else do both soldiers and civilians and I saw this repeatedly in Iraq that was part of the Americans. Why often were you both soldiers and civilians when a war was often a bomb? Or when a bomb was often a war, rather. Uh, or a bomb was often a marathon, for that matter. Why do they run towards the blast to help their neighbors and comrades and not run away from the blast? I never once saw an Iraqi run towards a blast. If culture is more than something that affects how we dress or what we eat or what festivals we like to celebrate, but something with the force of human nature itself, then culture more than anything else shapes the prospects for liberty, for democracy, and for peace world. Culture, and by that I mean especially today, religious culture, shapes a people's outlooks, its aspirations, what it hopes to be just and what it hopes to be bizarre. The fact remains that what a person believes is just and unjust, what leads him to act, is always shaped more by his culture than anything else. That is why the love of justice might be natural to all humanity, the content and meaning of that justice is far more often decided by custom, by culture, than by argument or philosophy. Again, this might be an obvious thing to say in a center devoted to the study of cultures worldwide. But while I understand the worry about multiculturalism on the part of many traditional academics, there's something correct about multiculturalism that cannot be overlooked. The truth of multiculturalism is not that all cultures are equal, but that all cultures are good in their own way, but that cultures are different and that culture matters. Some social structures encourage individual effort and reward, and these will result in distinctly different societies from those that encourage, let's say, envy or dependence. Some religions are more biblical those, and then so will be their adherents. Given that, the task of today's multicultural studies is not to critify other ways of life to help us celebrate other cultures, nor is it to make believe that all cultures are equally valuable, nor is it even to show us the comforting similarities or help us see the, quote, common threads of our humanity. In this dangerous and unfriendly world, the task of the study of other cultures is simply to understand them deeply, clearly, and plainly. Let's end by returning to the matter directly at hand. 
whether or not the spreading of democracy is desirable or even for that matter possible. The simple fact is that freedom and democracy have social and cultural preconditions. And that some nations, many nations, there are, there are many nations where the preconditions for just and free democratic rule are absent. So how optimistic should we be about the prospects for liberal democracy in the world? As I started to say before, if history is any guide, what will ultimately happen is that the tumultuousness of the Arab Spring will probably not lead to a calm or steady growth of free democratic life, but rather life will get, sorry to say, messier. The partisans of the old regime, the military, the secularists and liberals, and some religious and tribal minorities will continue to clash with, let's say, Islamists of different stripes and whatever the prominent ethnic or tribal group turns out to be. Above all, it will be a period of continued and even increased repression against women, against discrete minorities, and pointedly against Christians, Jews, and a few smaller other religious sects. Already one of the major religious watchdog, watchdog houses lists Iraq, where I spent so much time, as the fourth most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian. Just under North Korea, Saudi Arabia, and that other place we had hoped to bring democracy and freedom, Afghanistan. In the end, what we was hoping to bring about order, stability, and liberty to the region will bring about exactly the opposite, a mix of both instability and repression. Despite this pessimism, it is not true to say that all is irretrievably lost. Nations and people do change. Religious toleration, as we talked about before, religious toleration was not always the hallmark of the West. The culture of slavery got eliminated, even though it meant the sacrifice of 600,000 lives. We have even in the last century seen nominally Islamic strongmen, I have Turkey in mind, promote the education and liberation of women, protect religious minorities, and work to secularize everyday life. Culture is ferociously powerful, but culture can change. That's the optimistic side. Sadly, so I would say, and this is most important, where the people of a nation are themselves where the people of the nation are themselves strongly sectarian, intolerant of difference, and skeptical of the equality of all that gives dignity and freedom to all, the promotion of democracy may well hinder rather than help progress. For you see, rather than changing the character of a people, the purer, of the purer a democracy is, the more it cements and even magnifies the character of its people. The outlook, the demands of the majority now rule, and culture now has the force of law and it wields the instruments of power. So, should America continue its attempt to overthrow autocrats and spread democracy abroad? Only, I would think, in the most limited of circumstances, and only with great caution. This means going forward that we might quietly try to, for example, uh, aid liberal and student movements in Iran, but I think we should be far more careful about Syria than we have been. Being careful means always asking a few rather basic questions. Do the people we would aid have an appreciation of freedom and a willingness to fight for it? More importantly, are they ready to fight for the freedom of their fellow citizens and able to live and work with them? Are they willing to live under a government and under a rule of law that both empowers and restrains the democratic majority? Are we, through democracy, empowering a culture that's tolerant and moderate, or a culture of sectarianism and even greater repression? Will this new democracy be eager to live in peace with foreign neighbors? Candid answers to these and other serious questions will tell us if it might be worth attempting again what we attempted, what I fear was so little success in Iraq and Afghanistan. Thank you. Yes, in the back, one in the white. 
I'm so glad to hear your discussion of this issue. Is there any talk of this issue in the upper levels among people who are making decisions about which countries we go into? Or is it just an assumption that everyone loves democracy? I, I don't know the answer to that. I used to be better connected in politics than I am. I've, I've, uh, I, I don't have any access to people of power much anymore. Uh, but I fear that the answer is America is a country that always lives by slogans. And the idea, uh, and I certainly see it in the current administration, uh, the idea that that democracy may have its problems, that democracy may not be may not be ice cream. Uh, uh, I don't see much visible talking about that. Now I do know that uh, uh, when it came to Syria, when it has come to Syria, uh, we've been a little more careful than we were in, let's say, in Libya or, or in Egypt. Uh, but but even now it seems that uh, despite some European hesitation in some areas, we're still wish willing to push far ahead uh, and empower uh, you know, a, a rebellion that we have really little knowledge of, and, and I don't think much hope that it will be a, uh, a liberal, calm, moderate, uh, free, freedom-loving for all people force. I just don't see that. And, and, and the reason is because uh, we're Americans. We just, you know, other than for me, and we all look on the, look on the brighter side, the cheery side of life. Uh, but I, I wish I could say that the answer is we're more careful now. I don't. I don't think we are. Yes, sir. freedom, uh, and the French Revolution led to uh, the terror and the guillotine. And then repression came back in, and only after that did they, over the years, work out that where, where they are now, a, a member of the liberal democratic world. Uh, and you're right, in some places it takes a long time. Uh, I think we were surprised by how quick, quickly it took Eastern Europe to become free and democratic. Uh, we're seeing that what was hoped for in Russia is a lot of backsliding. 
I don't know that that has a rosy future either. But the reason why I'm so pessimistic, pessimistic is that the seed, as I was trying to say at the end, I don't think that these new democracies are going to, oh, give them time, give them time. I don't think that these new democracies are, over time, going to become more moderate, more tolerant, uh, more free. And in fact, I think the opposite is about to happen. I think the, the old paradigm, not that you start with basic freedom and that freedom grows, but that the messiness of, democrat free, of, of, of new free democratic life leads to so much chaos that repression then returns. And that I think the future of uh, Egypt, I, I'm pretty sure the future of Afghanistan, uh, uh, Iraq may be the best of them, uh, but even there the future is quite murky, that the future is not steady, hard, difficult, labored progression towards greater liberal democracy, but the return of repression, the return of Napoleon to France, uh, and now the return of Putin to, uh, to the former Soviet Union and to Russia. Uh, that, that it's not straight motion, but, but, but regressive motion. And I said that, and I said that, so that's one possibility, and I think a very serious possibility. Afghanistan will fall to the Taliban, and yes, there may be some parts of it that will may, may, may be able to keep itself free, but Afghanistan will go back to being as repressive a regime as it's ever been. Uh, despite our attempts to make it liberal and democratic. Others uh, may linger for a while longer, but repression, but, but uh, autocracy may return. Or the, the, the democracy may continue, but because, as I tried to say at the very end, because whatever the main views, cultural views, religious views are, they now have the force of law it could remain a democracy, but not be a liberal democracy. I don't see any reason to think that liberty grows. I don't see any reason to see why, given time, Afghanistan will say, you know, gee, maybe we should have a little more liberty in this country. I mean, the, we have this great understanding, and it took me, I've got to tell you, by surprise, uh, I'll give you the example in Iraq. We, well, we talked to the people in Iraq and we said, you know, we're going to try to bring peace to this country. That's okay, that's good, peace is good. Uh, we're going to try to bring prosperity to this country. Prosperity, that's great, we, that, that's excellent. And we're going to bring freedom to the country. And, and, and I would have friends who would say, you know, in America, we have religious freedom. And they said, well, tell us about it. He said, well, you can be any religion you want, or no religion. Uh, uh, it's free. It's free. Just, you know, do what you want. That's a free country. He said, well, why do you like that? Do you think God likes that? That you could, are you free to curse God in your country? Well, yeah. But why do you like freedom? What, what good is it? We somehow think that, that freedom is automatically lovable. But I'm not sure it is. Even in the realm of economics, it was a big problem. We would say, oh, okay, well, we're going to have freedom, we're going to have free enterprise. People can own their own property. Yes, own your own property, that's good. Uh, and, you know, and you can develop your own property. And, you know, you might, hit, you might even hit the lucky and, and find oil on your property, or copper, or uranium, or whatever. But, well, but, but then you have to give it up. So, no, no, no. If you, if you find it, it's yours. Oh, no. Oh no, 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 you can't be free to own what we all own. This, the, the, the resources of the country belong to all of us, not to any individuals. And so what happens? What happens is nobody owns the, no, you may own the land, uh, but there's no reason to drill, because you can't own what you can. Uh, even when I saw in parts of Iraq, uh, oil that almost bubble up on the, on the ground, you see slips on the ground, uh, people owned the land, it wasn't theirs. Uh, and because everybody owned it, nobody owned it. And then what they find out is that, you know, oil resources, what are we going to do? Well, let's, we have to now call in foreign companies to help us. And then they get embarrassed, they're, they're not doing it themselves, but they have an ideology that, that the freedom of ownership is not a great thing. Now, in a way, I can understand this. 
just in the way I can understand their, their qualms about religious freedom. <clears throat> you know, aren't we a community? Don't we have to all obey the same rules? Don't we all have to pray to the same God? Don't we all have to share the wealth in common? And the answer is, not if you want peace, and not if you want prosperity. But sometimes you got to do the most counterintuitive thing. Like people mind their own business and do their own thing. That's a hard thing for lots of companies. Yes, sir. Coming from the Bronx, I had a little difficulty understanding the book that I have to say. <laughs> but I believe that you can't have political freedom without economic freedom. That business, and when I see the moment, I mean business. That business is the international language. Everybody understands business, but they can relate to it. The question is, do you think we can make more progress about freedom to emphasize more business concerns rather than an influence and influence and Good question. Very good question. Uh, I think by and large your premise is right, that uh, uh, economic freedom and political freedom, I'm not sure which comes first, although a lot of people say economic freedom comes first, but they tend to go hand in hand. There's no, I'm not going to dispute that. Although I do think we could see places in the world today where economic freedom doesn't always lead to political freedom. I think there's a lot more economic freedom in China, I'm not sure there's much more political freedom. A lot more economic freedom in Russia, I'm not sure there's more political freedom. Uh, but let's uh, give into it. Uh, we did try that. We went and said, look, uh, one of the first things we did was to uh, give back to everyone, or we Americans, uh, uh, passed the, we, we had the Iraqi Governing Council pass the law that said everyone whose property had been taken away by Saddam Hussein gets their property. So it becomes private property. He was your property. He wasn't allowed to take it away. Uh, that ran into lots of difficulties. First, it ran into lots of difficulty from uh, the uh, from the Ayatollah Sistani, who made everybody change their vote because that meant that the Jews would have to get that property back. And so it didn't go very far. Then uh, it went so, so far. We have said we said okay, state-owned business sh should be privatized. We also like Margaret Thatcher over there. State-owned enterprises should be privatized. Nobody wanted that. They all wanted, I mean, this was a country where everyone got free health care. It was horrible health care, but everybody got it. Uh, free education, pretty crappy education, everybody got it. Everybody got, uh, uh, if you didn't own your own house, and maybe, I, I don't want to say most, but certainly a large portion of people didn't, you got uh, state housing, uh, so housing projects to live in. Uh, you got a food basket. Everybody, every month, got a food basket. And we said, we're going to monitor the food basket. We're going to wean you away from getting food baskets, and so we're going to give you money. No, we want our food basket. Uh, the idea of economic freedom was not attractive. They, do you understand how, how comforting it is to know every month you don't have to work for your food? You're just going to get it? That you don't have to work to, for your house? It's a lousy house, but you don't have to work for it, you're just going to get it. Once you had a job in Iraq under Saddam, and also uh, now, too, uh, you have a job. No matter how you screw up, you're not going to lose your job. And I had people who said, oh, I want to go to America, I'll take my family to America. And then they'd say, but if I get a job, somebody could fire me. I said, well, if you do real bad, yeah, you will get fired. But then I'm not going to America. Nobody can fire me in this country. Uh, now, one place where this wasn't true, and it's the only place where I have real hopes for democracy, is in the Kurdish part of Iraq. In the Kurdish part of Iraq, what's yours is yours. Your property is private, you own it. Uh, uh, yes, most people work for, this, work for the Kurdistan regional government, uh, but you want to you want to start a private industry? You want to start a private company? Feel free. 
knock yourself out, go do it. And so all of the premiers who are out there are Nissan dealerships, uh, they're reporting Fords and Chevys, I mean there's a the Mercedes and a, and a BMW everywhere, it's become a rich part of Iraq. Uh, and they have really free democratic elections, it's not a totally free country, you still got to watch what you say. Uh, uh, but not really. I mean, if you want to say, I think, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the people who are ruling this, this, uh, this part of our country uh, need to change, you're free even to set up a political party and run against them. Uh, so their economic freedom and political freedom, and the other thing was religious freedom, uh, even though there are almost no Christians left in Iraq. Uh, they, the, the numbers have gone down by 90 plus percent. Where did they go? Well, they were going throughout the Syria. They always go to Lebanon. They go right after Jordan. But mostly they go to Kurdistan. Uh, and in Kurdistan, there is absolutely no uh, religious intolerance, period. Uh, you say, well, are they Muslims? I say, yes, of course they're Muslims. Uh, yeah, they're, they're good Sunni Muslims. But uh, the truth is, they would rather open a Nissan dealership than kill you for your religion. They just don't see any profit in killing you for your religion. Uh, and so, yes, uh, that's what we were attempting to do in, in regular Iraq. Uh, to bring economic freedom, to bring some understanding of religious toleration, and then having those things as part of your culture, you could have a democracy. I, got, I have high hopes for Iraq. Uh, for Kurdish Iraq. I don't have my hopes for Iraq. Yes, we'll go here and then we'll go to the other side. Yeah. single-minded. Uh, uh, and so I think a lot of different interest groups are good. You, you divert people's attention from why they want to kill their neighbor. That's an important thing to do. Uh, uh, but second, what Madison wanted to do was to, not to have any big 
unified single interest group governing the country. So that just as we have different interests ourselves, there's no single majority interest. And you know, what's the, this was a hard thing for, for uh, let's say, the religious world to understand, that when you have Catholics and Protestants, they fight. When you have Christians and Jews, they fight. When you have uh, Baptists and Catholics and Presbyterians and Methodists and Jews and Muslims and Mormons and, and atheists and agnostics, well, it's hard to get a it's hard to get a gang going to, you know, to, to beat the other side. And pretty soon you're going to live together. And so I, I'm, I'm a little less, if I understand you correctly, a little less uh, disturbed by uh, uh, a lot of different people with a lot of different views. I said, I like that. Let me go on. I, I've neglected this side, yes. Uh, I like a lot of what you said. I agree with it, the centrality of culture uh, and so forth. I've got a few problems. One is you quoted Tocqueville. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not a problem. Tocqueville should always be quoted. One thing he said is an abstract idea is like a box with a false bottom. You put anything in it you want, take anything out that you want. Democracy and freedom are big abstract ideas. So we're saying we want democracy, we want freedom, do all men or all women want freedom? Well, political philosophers have argued for a couple hundred years about what does freedom mean, what does democracy mean? So I think asking the question and develop, basing a foreign policy on it is just absolutely the wrong way to go. You've got to ask more fundamental questions. I think you're getting at that, but you know, the other problem, two other problems, one is promoting is an abstract idea. So you say, should we promote democracy? Well, I remember in the 50s, we promoted democracy with libraries and the Louis Armstrong and the Nitty Brick Dirt Band and so forth. We, we worked at culture. We did other stuff too, but we worked at culture. In Iraq and Afghanistan, we sent bombers, and that's really not a very good way to promote democracies by blowing things up and killing people. So that's so to ask the question, what's, can we promote democracy? You gotta ask what kind of freedom, what kind of democracy, what kind of promoting are we talking about? And then the, the last thing I'd say is, uh, I know you don't mean it to come off this way, but a lot of what the tone or undertone of the way you, you've been speaking is, you know, we are better than Iraqis. You know, they just don't get it. And I know you don't mean it that way, but a lot of it comes off that way. And, you know, they got to be the under Saddam, and then they got to the bits. It's pretty tough. I, there was no question there, so there's nothing for me to answer. But, not to say us versus Iraq, but I do think we are a lot better than a lot of other people. I'm just, I'm ashamed to say that. Okay. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, you have so many questions. But some people need to leave. So perhaps the, the people who want to ask questions could stay. I, I know that a lot of students need to, to leave, and we did advertise 5.30 to 6.30. Please stay if you have questions. Dr. Resto did drive in today from Santa Fe to But I, he's also a love, love <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh.